TCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, I will be presenting an orthopedic emergency case that presented to our ER. Can I start, sir? Yeah. Sure. A 32-year-old male patient was brought to our ER with a history of right shoulder pain after his uh, fall. Uh, initial 10-second assessment, patient was conscious, oriented and obeying to my comment. Airway, patient was talking in one full sentence. There was no gurgling, strider pooling of secretion, there was no loose tooth, any uh, no oral bleeding or any hoarseness of voice. Mm, C-spine patient came in walking, uh, so they are uh, anticipating that there is no C-spine injuries. Uh, breathing, chest movements were bilaterally normal with a respiratory rate of 18 and a saturation of 99% in room air. Bilateral air entry was equal and heart sounds were also normal. There was no added sounds or uh, subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, circulation, uh, heart rate was 92 per minute with a blood pressure of 11070 and MAP of 84 and uh, CRT was less than uh, 3 seconds and all peripheral pulses were felt equally and bilaterally. Uh, disability, his GCS was 15 on 15, pupils were 2.5 mm reactive. Uh, disability was he was having a, a restriction of movement around the right shoulder and with the pain score of 7 by 10. Sir. An exposure, temperature was 98 degree Fahrenheit and hypothermia was prevented by blanket. Uh, as a part of adjuncts to uh, uh, primary survey, uh, looks like an isolated shoulder injury. No, at this point, what is the priority? Pain is the priority, no. sir. So, uh, uh, large bore IV cannula was inserted and uh, I uh, prefer to give paracetamol as the uh, first uh, uh, analgesic, sir. So, paracetamol 1 gram was given uh, and I uh, was planning to uh, assess, uh, assess the pain score after the injection, sir. Uh, How was it given, paracetamol 1 gram? IV. IV. How is everything in there? 7 by 10 pain score. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is it paracetamol is enough or... Uh, you wanted to add on something or we can wait after some time. So what is the type of injury? It's an inflammatory probably, it's a traumatic inflammatory injury. So what will be an ideal choice in this patient initially for the pain management? Uh, NSAID or uh, if the pain is very severe, we should go for opioids. NSAID is So paracetamol uh, with an NSAID or an NSAID will be an ideal option in this patient. Because an isolated musculoskeletal injury with a shoulder injury, if we don't have any comorbidities, NSAID will be the first choice here. Paracetamol, I am not denying it is not a good choice. It's a safer drug, we can give it easily. But when you compare the cost factor of paracetamol with an Ketralac or an uh, whatever be the NSAID, the cost factor is 10 rupees to 250 rupees. So that is the difference. Paracetamol tablet, 1 gram cost you 3 rupees. Okay. But 1 gram IV paracetamol cost 300. you 250 rupees. So that is the difference that you need to understand. So, uh, first of all, you can give NSAID, I am not denying it, paracetamol is fine. Next option will be a weaker opioids mm -hmm. or if you have significant more than 7 or 8, the pain score is high, you can straight away give with an, go Stronger. ahead with a stronger opioid like fentanyl or even morphine you can give. But always remember that the mechanism of injury and you have to treat that mechanism of injury as so. Inflammatory pain, NSAID, paracetamol will be an ideal option. So many a time what will happen is that inflammatory pain will give opioids but again the patient pain will come after some time we are not the problem with fentanyl is that once you give the first dose when the second wave the patient is going to have it the pain will be much more severe once the action is over so you have to always have a continuous plan of pain management especially in this group of patients anything else sir? add on so i don't even non pharmacological methods in addition, we can give pharmacological methods, aside from the positioning, comfortable positioning. Splinting, positioning, Splinting. all these things also in a, together can be considered. Uh, ample history. Uh, there is no allergies. Patient is not on any medication. Patient had a history of anterior shoulder dislocation one year back after a history of fall uh, and uh, which was reduced and immobilized. Then for the, uh, other than that nothing was there and uh, last meal was taken three hours back. Uh, history uh, events is patient had a history of slip and fall at home and he fell down an outstretched hand following which he had pain over the right shoulder associated with restriction of movement. Uh, after the fall, uh, during the fall there was no head injury, loss of consciousness, vomiting, seizures or any other injuries. So, uh, since this is a uh, isolated shoulder injury, I, uh, uh, I cannot say it's an isolated shoulder injury. At present, uh, at present we can't say. with the history what you have got, it's an isolated shoulder injury. Yes, when you go ahead and with an examination, you will come to know 
what else is happening to this patient? So I moved on to the uh, exam, head to toe examination, mm -hmm. sir. Um, head examination, uh, there was no uh, uh, face was symmetrical. There was no facial injuries. Uh, and neck examination also, C spine was normal. There was no C spine tenderness. Uh, then uh, shoulder examination. When I went to shoulder examination, uh, inspection. Uh, before inspecting, I asked uh, consent of the patient. And uh, with personal protective equipments, I approached the patient. And the both shoulders were exposed, sir. And I uh, offered analgesic one more time for the patient, but uh, patient uh, pain score reduced to 5 by 10 and he was not asking for analgesic. So I went ahead with examination. Uh, inspection, uh, what is uh, the right shoulder was in a lower position as compared to the left shoulder and the uh, shoulder was a um, little bit abducted and externally rotated and there was a squaring of the right shoulder. Sir. Uh, then uh, patient was sitting a bit le leaned forward also. Uh, there was no other scars, erythemas, hematomas or any signs of open fractures uh, other than this deformity, nothing else was there and I went ahead with palpation. Okay. So one thing what you said is correct, you have to expose the joint. That is the most important and you have to compare it with the normal joint. So the person is wearing a shirt, ask him to remove him completely and you have to inspect him anteriorly, posteriorly as well as laterally. Whatever be the way, you have to inspect around the patient. Because majority of the time, anteriorly sometimes you will not be see anything, yes, and posteriorly only you will be able to see. So that is the most important thing that you have rightly said. And uh, inspection findings from what all inspectory findings, what all you said, the shoulder was? Shoulder was at a lower position as compared to the other Lower shoulder. position when compared to the opposite side. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing. Then what yes. was the position of the, how was his holding his uh, uh, affected limb, whether it was internally rotated, externally rotated, or whether he was not able to abduct, abduct. It was a little bit abducted and externally rotated. He was not holding his hand, but uh, it was ex usually in dislocation, especially anterior dislocation, patient will be holding the hand. Uh, it was abducted and externally rotated, sir. Abducted and abducted and externally rotated. rotated. So he was not holding and he was just keeping, keeping the hand like, like this. this. Okay. So, and the shoulder was displaced uh, inferior. Inferior. Okay. And uh, okay, that, that's fine. Cut it. Um, and uh, I inspected from uh, and front side and from back, sir. Um, then palpation wise, there was tenderness over the shoulder joint, and the uh, humeral head uh, uh, was a little bit anterior to the glenoid. Um, so uh, simultaneous uh, with that, uh, and there was uh, then I checked the sensations and the. How will you do palpatory of a joint? What all, how will you do the palpation? Especially shoulder joint. So from where will you start mm -hmm. and what are the main bony prominence that you need to palpate? Yes, sir. Uh, we should palpate the clavicle, uh, rule of clavicular fractures, then the acromion. So most important idea will be from less pain, pain to, to more pain. More pain that is priority. You ask him where is having more pain. For example, is showing tip of the shoulder. That will be the last area that you should be palpating. Palpating. So all other area from the ideally from the sternoclavicular joint you have to start and you have to look for any fractures mm -hmm. and come to the joint and like that which are the important uh, tips uh, bony prominence that you need to palpate is one is uh, acromion, acromion. acromion process then uh, the uh, glenoid and the uh, uh, humeral head sorry. humeral head these are the three important bony prominences that need to palpate in a shoulder injury. So what was the findings here? In this uh, patient, uh, the humeral head appears uh, displaced a little bit anterior and inferiorly, sir. Uh, tenderness? Tenderness was, uh, uh, patient was complaining of tenderness all around the joints. So all around the shoulder, shoulder joint. joint. It was not any bony, bony. prominent as such. Oh. So that says that he don't ha might not be having any bony injury. Injuries. It might be a soft, soft tissue injury. Injuries. If there is surrounding uh, so, uh, swelling and uh, pain around the joint usually it will be like that no clavicular pain, pain nothing was there so usually shoulder injury is associated with a clavicular fracture Fractures. which is a, where is the clavicle most common to get fractured uh, between the um, uh, lateral one third and the medial two thirds the reason uh, because it is the uh, where the ossification center and where the uh, there will be a turn it will be the thinnest thin part. part usually when you do the thin part of the clavicle and usually when you go inside when the uh, clavicle is having a fracture like more medially means the mechanism of injury is high, high. it is a high impact injury if there is a lateral as you said the lateral uh, part if there is a fracture it is a usual common site for a clavicle fracture if you are seeing a medial aspect of fracture you have to think that 
definitely the impact is high and there is a high chance of greater vessel injury that is and lung injury and greater vessel injury okay now uh, rest examination then uh, we should suspend so mostly it looks like an anterior dislocation no no, no. Mm -hmm. examination is not ah. over palpation palpation further uh, palpation uh, further palpation we have to look for the sensation sir mm. uh, uh, if it is shoulder involvement we should suspect axillary nerve injury and we should uh, look for the sensation or the bad uh, the regimen bad sign should be checked sir that sensation was checked and it was normal then distal pulses were checked that that was also present sir okay any specific uh, tests that you need to do uh, we have the Hamilton ruler test sir and the Dugas test. Dugas test means we ask the patient to hold the opposite shoulder with the affected limb. That will not be possible in a dislocated and dislocated shoulder. Then the Hamilton ruler test we will be keeping a ruler from the acromion process to the uh, 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 lower line of the humerus. Usually we will be that will be touching the bony prominence Both if the uh, prominences if the uh, if there is an anterior dislocation. Otherwise it will not touch. Uh, then uh, other tests are Calvary test, Brian test and all. This is to measure the uh, vertical and circumference of the shoulders. Routinely what we will ask is we will ask them to touch the opposite shoulder. shoulder. If we are able to do that, then most likely there is no dislocation or major injuries is not there. Because so, when you are asking to touch the shoulder, which all movements is coming? Adduction. You have having adduction, an adduction, internal, internal rotation. rotation. So these are the two major movements. So, whenever you are having that, usually this patient, I don't think he will be able to touch the opposite shoulder. It would have been a painful thing for him. Okay. Then? Uh, and the special test. Joint movements. Which all movements was restricted? So, whenever you inspect a joint, what are the things that you need to say? Inspection, you said. Okay. Rightly said. Upper limb, lower limb, you have to tell, start from the gate. Okay. So, here you have started with the inspection. Okay. Then, you have said regarding palpation. Okay. Then, you said any special okay. test needed to be done. Then movements, mm -hmm. passive as well as active. active movements. So, uh, what was the situation? If it is painful, we will not do. If mm -hmm. it is painless, we can ask for uh, assessment of the mm -hmm. joint movements. Uh, patient uh, can be asked to passively uh, abduct, adduct the limb and to internal rotate, but uh, it was very painful, sir. Okay. So, uh, I didn't. So, if there is a problem with the uh, patient passive, then we will not be doing any active, active. examination. Okay, then most importantly, as you said, distal neurovascular deficit, as you said, axillary nerve injury, very prone to develop the axillary nerve injury in a shoulder dislocation or any shoulder injury, it is very prominent to have an axillary. And so, how will you examine, you have said regarding the regimental area, mm -hmm. as well as the, what are the uh, tests that you need to do on the uh, muscular test that you need to do on the uh, upper limb? Uh, usually axillary nerve itself supplies the deltoid and the teres minor muscles sir. Uh, so we should examine for uh, those uh, movements. Deltoid will be doing the abduction and the uh, teres minor uh, movement will be doing the external rotation. Okay. And again, just don't take it for granted as just axillary nerve, brachial plexus, anywhere injury can happen. So definitely a distal neurovascular Sensation. examination need to be checked. And most importantly here, he had a fall with an outstretched hand. Right. So, we can have other, other injuries practice. also and you need to go ahead for other joint examination, which will be the priorities for this. Uh, fall on outside in children, it can be uh, su uh, supracondylar fracture of humerus is there. Then in adults, uh, there can be colis fracture, then scaphoid fracture can be there. So, sir. you start from your carpal bones, start from your metacarpals, mm -hmm. carpal bones and uh, go to your uh, uh, radial nerve joint and uh, your uh, elbow joint. So usually if there is an injury, the patient will be complaining of pain. But scaphoid fractures is that what can miss. Yes. Because the later on the patient can come with a pain around this area. So that should not be mixed. You look for tenderness in the anatomical snuff box. box. Fine. So uh, rest of the limb examination was uh, done sir. Uh, elbow examination and the uh, wrist and the uh, uh, hand examination was done. There was no tenderness. Uh, as such and uh, sensa um, sensation was also checked in the rad uh, radial nerve uh, areas and the ulnar and median nerve areas. Okay. Everything was normal sir. Uh, and uh, going to the other examination, uh, whole body examination, other, uh, otherwise there was no other injury. So, uh, so it was an isolated, uh, isolated shoulder, shoulder injury. injury. Most likely from examination fine we are suspecting an anterior dislocation. Anterior, inferior okay. or anterior dislocation. Uh, since it is a lower position, can be an anterior inferior dislocation. So, which is the most common one? Anterior dislocation. Anterior dislocation. Posterior dislocation? Uh, it is uh, less than half percentage only posterior dislocation. Uh, sorry, 
two to three percentage and mm. half less than half percentage only inferior dislocation will be happen. Okay. Usually posterior dislocation happen in case of electrocution or in case of seizure. High impact injuries. Yes. Yeah, remember that it's a high impact injury. Usually the shoulder will get dislocated anteriorly. Anterior. That is the where it is lacking the support. So that is the usual anatomy. When you have a posterior dislocation means the impact of injuries that much high. Okay. Okay. Uh, then inferior dislocation of the shoulder patient will be presented with a uh, super ab uh, hyper abducted limb okay. uh, uh, so you are suspecting an anterior dislocation, dislocation. of the shoulder mm -hmm. probably without any bony Bull fractures fracture. as per from the examination because you didn't find any bony permanent tenderness so that is one thing that is against now how will you proceed now uh, we should confirm our uh, findings with an x-ray sir uh, usually x-ray is indicated in all dislocations except uh, in if suppose the patient is having a loss of distal pulse and all in such cases we will be directly uh, going for a reduction otherwise we should go for an x-ray so x-ray this patient we have taken a ap x-ray of the right shoulder ap and lateral view was taken and we have seen a subglenoid dislocation of the uh, shoulder sir so you uh, usually the uh, anterior dislocation is of four type it can be subcoracoid subglenoid uh, uh, subclavian and intrathoracic uh, so subcoracoid and subglenoid are the commonest common ones one. so how will you differentiate this thing from the x-ray um, so if it is just below the coracoid it will be uh, seen as subcoracoid and if it is below seen the below the clenoid subglenoid below the clavicle subclavicular and uh, inside the thorax it's, it's very rare intrathoracic and clavicular is very rare it can but uh, the other one is the most common is subcoracoid and subglenoid mm -hmm. fine so uh, that is from the x-ray so mm -hmm. you will ask for an x-ray ap yeah. view and lateral view many a times the problem is that they will not be able to take a lateral view yes, so whether lateral view is really needed no sir uh, uh, the uh, ap itself is confirmatory and we, we can take some other special views also can be taken mm. uh, sir uh, there is scapular y view is there that is to find uh, the scapula will be in the shape of y and if the uh, fracture is more medially that means it's anterior dislocation uh, sorry the dislocation is anterior medial means anterior dislocation it is lateral means posterior dislocation is there uh, then we uh, special x-rays are there well view is there and then to find uh, for the uh, bank guard lesion and the hill sacs lesion hill sac lesion means there will be a bony depression in the humerus because of the glenoid rim so uh, for that we can take the um, hill point view hill point. or the uh, hill sacs you can be taken and uh, uh, sorry and bony bank guard lesion we can take a uh, striker notch view can be so bank guards and hill, hill sacs hill that's what you said so which is more common bank guards or hill sacs uh, hill sacs, uh, hill sacs, bo uh, yes. Bank cards and hill sacs are common, but more mm. I think it is bank cards okay. so we need to refer that. I think it is bank cards okay. Can you just tell what is bank cards and hill sacs okay. Hill sac lesion is that it is seen on the humerus. Mm. Uh, we will be seeing a bony depression on the humerus because of the glenoid rim uh, injury. Uh, because of the glenoid rim, there will be a depression coming on to the humerus. Then bank guard lesion, there is both bony bank guard and the bank guard lesion so if the glenoid rim is injured then it is bank guard and if if it is associated with a bony injury also it is called bony bony bank guard so these are the one two things that you need to remember so uh, the problem is that many a times you order for an x-ray and you order for an x-ray and many a time the x-ray room itself it will get reduced mm -hmm. that's a usual thing well, especially the patient who's having recurrent dislocations when they because of the manipulation done by the radiographer itself the uh, shoulder dislocation will get reduced. So the most important, if you are able to take one view, go ahead with an AP view. If you are able to take a lateral view, well and good. So we will be able to differentiate whether it is an anterior or a posterior or you can go for, as you said, the special view like hill point view, all the other views like uh, scapula, wave view, all those things can be taken. Fine. Then a CT and all can be taken. CT uh, can be taken if to find associated bony injuries and MRI for uh, associated rotator cuff injuries. Rotator cuff injuries. Okay. Fine. So uh, now he has come back with the X-ray. So what was X-ray showing? X-ray was showing a sub uh, coracoid fracture, sir. Subcoracoid uh, dislocation. Anterior sub dislocation. Subcoracoid anterior dislocation. dislocation of the shoulder, sir. Um, so uh, we. Uh, should, uh, so we we should reduce as early as possible, sir, uh, to avoid any uh, injury to the ligaments and to the uh, 
to avoid the necrosis of the bones. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, before reduction, we should take an informed consent uh, for uh, sedation and for reduction. And we should uh, tell the risk of injury to the axillary nerve uh, during the process of uh, reduction. It can impinge on the axillary nerves. Uh, Procedure sedation. So you can um, enlighten upon the what type of sedation, how will you choose it? So we have, well, you can select different categories of patient. Excellent. You have a young stable patient okay. who would come to you. You can have an elderly male who had come to you. Mm. Or maybe a middle aged person with some comorbidities that has come to you. Mm. So how will you select the agent? Mm. And uh, whenever you say regarding procedural sedation, it should provide what all things? Yeah. Whenever we are planning for a procedural sedation, sir, uh, we should arrange all things uh, so that if at all the patient goes uh, goes into a deep sedation, we should secure the airway. You know. So uh, for that, uh, we should place two large bore IV cannulas. Oxygen should be arranged and patient can be started on uh, uh, low flow oxygen can be started for the patient. Uh, then cardiac monitors should be connected and a crash cart also should be arranged, sir. And uh, informed consent, when we are taking the consent, we should all t tell the bystander and the patient about the risk of this. Sir. And a competent person to manage any area Airway. issues. Airway. Okay, what else will you keep in mind? Uh, and all the equipments uh, for uh, resuscitation uh, and, uh, emergency and the emergency drugs, drugs should be arranged. Suction, oxygen and all these things mixed. Okay. Is there any correlation you have to keep in mind about the last meal or yes, any sir. your status? Yes, sir. Is this essential? Yes, sir. Why? Uh, because uh, uh, any, if we are sedating, any time the patient can vomit and aspiration risk is also So, the there. level of sedation may be changed yes, from a mild Simple moderate sedation. to deeper. So, suddenly the patient vomits, aspiration chances will be there. Better, some textbooks say there is no need for this NPO part, but it is absolutely from patient's life of view, we have to keep an adequate spacing of the time. Then, then age and selection, yeah. sir. See, what are the goal of the procedural sedation? Uh, we want uh, we, uh, anxiolytic, analgesic and also uh, sedative. Now, one still patient should be still. Mm -hmm. Patient may or may not have pain. Mm -hmm. So, the procedure may be painful procedure or non-painful procedure. But we want the patients to be still with, for example, this agitating patient or children, they will not be cooperating. Even for uh, investigation, imaging like CT, MRI. So, the pain may not be there. So, another type is we need patient should be still as well as pain free. Pain. So, we have to go for any anxiolytic alone or with the analgesic also. Okay, then. Uh, then we, drug selection, sir. Now, how will you select for this patient? This and usually patient. what are the things? Okay. See, the, the drug name is different, dose is different. Okay. But how to select and what are the precautions you have to know from the starting to the end. Okay. This is a young patient, sir, mm. uh, with a dislocation of shoulder. So we can give an uh, we, the agent we which we selected was a midazolam and fentanyl, sir. Mm. So uh, midazolam is having a, a sedative action and also an anxiolytic action. So um, it was selected and associated with fentanyl uh, as an analgesic was started, mm. sir. Yeah. So based on what are the criteria, one is the uh, severity of the pain, pain yeah. scale, mm -hmm. and the duration of the procedure, yes. and uh, any need for any muscle relaxants is necessary mm -hmm. or not. Okay, and four is the, whether the patient has gone to some other center, already he has received any sedative yes. agent in the recent time. Fifth is whether the patient is in any intoxicating drugs or alcoholic effect. And, and the brief history about any other previous history of any uh, reaction to the sedative drugs and all. Hmm? Okay. Uh, since midazolam and fentanyl are uh, short acting drugs and uh, rapid onset of action, we selected that, mm. sir. Uh, midazolam. And the procedure is a short procedure. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so, uh, 2 milligram of midazolam was given. And the evaluation of the patient. As such, can we jump to administer the drug or do you want to evaluate anything else before any sedation? Air, airway. CABC, all three okay. airway, especially any difficult airway situation may occur. Mm -hmm. That also you have to and rule out. Okay. Number two, all hemodynamic changes, mm -hmm. BPA things. So in the drug selection, it is okay. counting mode and any renal or hepatic okay. dysfunction. At least you have to keep uh, these things in front. So the agent should be in such a way that it will not compromise further hemodynamic changes okay. or respiratory. Okay, next. Uh, uh, 
so uh, if at all we are suspect here we have tie that's what sir is telling so not like rsa ah, rsa is not rsa uh, okay. so we can have a proper lemon evaluation mm -hmm. we can have an amelability scoring you can have all those things documented so we can have you anticipate a possibility of a difficult airway keep everything ready if in case of an emergency so we have time here that is a priority in a procedure sedation we have time in rsa we don't have time we have to immediately go ahead and intubate so assessment sometimes so full malambity scoring and all will not be able to possible here this patient can stand up open his mouth and see what is his uh, arch everything arch of palate everything you can see so that is always better to do a proper assessment document it okay. proper assessment document it and go ahead with the drug selections okay. after the, like uh, this one monitoring aspects okay. see how long we uh, want to continue monitoring what are the monitors you want to use come on i can tell you Uh, what the most essential monitors before the uh, giving sedation sir we should document the patient's vitals mm -hmm. before oh. the, uh, before starting okay. baseline okay. sedation and after giving uh, the sedation uh, we should uh, just after giving after 1 minute 5 minute and every, uh, every minute one person should be there and assess the constant the you so can say continuous continuous monitoring should be there so what are the things will be monitor uh, patient's heart rate uh, heart rate should be uh, what are monitors will you attach and what uh, are the parameters you will monitor uh, we should connect the saturation probes the cardiac monitors and the bp okay sure. any other thing uh, available uh, etc photo etc photo so ventilation we can assess the earliest any derangement only with etc photo so other things will and also observation of the patient breathing uh, physically okay next Okay. Regarding this patient, suppose the patient is volume mm -hmm. uh, status is compromised, mm -hmm. hypovolemia because of that, we have to increase the volume. Volume no? status Com associated. Correct. Fluid. So some most of the drugs will cause hypotension. hypotension. Okay. Next. Uh, so, uh, so you are selecting the midazolam and fentanyl. Fentanyl. fentanyl combination. Why this combination do you want? Uh, uh, there is a. Uh, What is the dosage you will be selecting for? Uh, this patient midazolam was started. Uh, 0.05 mg per kg was started so 2 mm. mg was given for this patient mm. and uh, uh, fentanyl uh, dose 1 to 2 microgram per kg mm. so okay. 70 microgram was selected for this patient so okay so how will you administer the drug for this patient most important thing um, iv administration mm. uh, okay uh, first midazolam will be given followed by uh, uh, fentanyl so these are all set doses average doses every patient should receive only titrated dose yes, according to the the effect the effect is the goal whatever yes. effect you want to get achieve that is the goal one pain relief to the patient is still and for the period of time we are expecting to finish the procedure, procedure. so this may vary between patient to patient so don't go blindly according to the weight basis yes. and in smaller dosage in increments yes, see what interval see the first dose should have its onset of action so you should know how how long it will take for the onset of action whether 1 minute or not till then we have to wait and the peak action of the first small dose should occur then you repeat the second dose so if you are going such a way according to the optimum or minimum dosage required for the patient we can stop it or is overdose and complications will occur and as you told from one stage deeper sedation may occur this is the case on this one okay good so whenever you are talking about any anesthetic drugs or any sedative drugs individualization and titration start with smaller doses wait for the peak action to come then repeat the doses as per need and the final goal is to achieve the effect we desire to have that's all okay carry on then uh, other drug selections sir mm. uh, so uh, instead of uh, this we can um, take a uh, midazolam with ketamine combination can mm. be taken sir so what is the advantage of this combination uh, uh, he, it will be uh, midazolam with ketamine will be having a uh, ketamine will be giving an additional uh, anxiolytic and sedative properties also there mm. with analgesic good analgesic property and Uh, rapid onset of action hemodynamics hemodynamic also the patient was already stable hemodynamic also uh, maintained sir so the main BP advantage is synergistic action we can reduce the dosage yes, of sir. each drug Drugs. instead of administering a single drug so the larger doses we have to give when a combination keep in mind so the doses can be reduced number 2 emergency delirium mm -hmm. this can be 
allied by the midazolam. Okay. Which can be midazolam will reduce. Okay. Good. So ketamine, in this, I, I would have preferred for a midazolam with ketamine. Mm. Uh, that would have been a better option. Mm. Because other than fentanyl, ketamine is a much superior drug. A yeah, young patient who is coming without any other comorbidities. In, with the, even unstable hemodynamic, definitely ketamine Ketum. would have been the choice. But uh, ketamine is a better option. So Analgesic property is there. Yeah. So we need not have to combine with uh, the okay. So what are the side effects of uh, ketamine or contraindications of ketamine? Uh, ketamine usually is contraindicated in case of hypertension and already if the BP is high, mm -hmm. uh, it is not advised. Then uh, okay. uh, hypertension is because of the pain. pain. Ketamine may bring pain. the BP to yes. normal level. Okay, yes. good. Uh, tachycardia hmm. is a contraindication. Okay. Then uh, side effects are uh, emergence phenomenon, uh, dissociative anesthesia. Okay. Uh, patient can have hallucinations and all. Okay. So, if you are planning to discharge the patient and all. Uh, Any other combination apart from this? Ketafol can be treated. Ketafol, okay. Good. There ketamine. the combination goes. What are ketamine the uh, with the propofol uh, is there. So, a propofol, one side effect is that it can reduce the BP, yeah. which can be uh, contracted, synergy, uh, contracted, contracted by ketamine. Sir. Okay. And ketamine may sometimes produce vomiting. Okay. This may be contracted by propofol, propofol also. Okay. The tachycardia produced by ketamine also may be reduced. Or undue increase in BP can be utilized by the propofol. So, the main advantage, the aim is the uh, sooner the procedure is over, the patient should wake up. That's all. Number two, see what are the most important thing in the uh, We have to keep the respiration and cardiovascular dynamics, physiological. The, the least changes should be permitted. There should not be any respiratory depression or fall in BP or other. This is the second. So accordingly, we have to select this one. Any other thing? Protective reflexes. Yes, as far as possible, in procedural sedation alone, uh, protective reflexes, cough reflex, uh, deglutination or swallowing reflex and uh, gag reflex, this should be intact. So the deeper the level this will be compromised and the airway compromise may occur. So when uh, unexpectedly the patient is going for airway compromise because of the deeper levels he is landing upon, falling back of the tongue and vomiting aspiration we have to keep in mind. Same patient, if uh, instead of that an young chap, he is like a 63, 65 year old lady, mm. okay, uh, with a history of coronary artery disease, mm. uh, is in front of you. So, what will be the drug selection at this point? Mm. Uh, Metasolam fentanyl combination can be used, sir. Uh, be, depending on the hemodynamics of the patient. So I wanted a better, longer sedation. Mm. Like maybe the procedure will be taking a little bit longer time. Okay. Maybe usually shoulder dislocation we will have like 3 to 5 minutes is what is mandatory required. I am telling you like I need a 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, what will be the agents that you can think of rather than fentanyl? Uh, Which we commonly use in our ear. Lower dose, can be lower dose of fentanyl. That is the one thing. Lower dose of fentanyl. That is one thing that you can remember. So what will be the lower dose of fentanyl? 0.1 milligram per kilogram body weight. So maybe somewhere around 8 mg, 6 okay. to 8 mg of etomidate along with the midazolam or depending with if there is a history of any myoclonic jerks. So midazolam with the combination or fentanyl with this combination will be uh, preventing that also. So uh, we haven't seen any myoclonic jerk, the so-called myoclonus following etomidate but that is one of the complication of etomidate that's supposed to see but we haven't seen much even with the procedural sedation. Okay. So, what are the various doses of uh, ketamine? Yeah. Uh, ketamine, uh, we have analgesic dose and for the uh, induction doses are also okay, there. The doses? Analgesic dose 0.5 to 1 and induction we can give 1 to 2. Can induction. What is the difference body? between analgesic and induction dosage? Effect wise? Of level of consciousness. Of consciousness. Uh, induction means they are knocking down the level of consciousness. This only analgesic. Yeah. Okay. Sub dissociative dosage. dosage. Now, you have given the sedation. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the methods by which you can think of reduction? In our ER, we usually practice the modified Hippocrates method, sir. Uh, it is actually uh, traction technique, traction, counter traction technique, sir. So, uh, one uh, person will be uh, standing on the side of the uh, 
affected uh, limb and the other person will be standing in the opposite side so uh, the person standing in the opposite uh, side will uh, take a uh, preferably a bed sheet or something to cover the chest portion from uh, both sides and to give the counter traction from the other side and the person who is on the same side should uh, do the traction uh, traction holding the elbow a patient should it should be uh, traction should be given and when the uh, a uh, shoulder is relocated there will be a click will be felt and after that the uh, limb should be adducted and internally rotated and should be immobilized uh, that is the uh, method used here sir then uh, various other there is no other help you are alone mm, alone uh, in such cases we can plan for a external rotation technique that is also called as a coaches method uh, that is by uh, making the patient in a put the patient in supine position ask the patient to adduct the limb and uh, uh, then with 90 degree flexion uh, the limb should be externally rotated like this uh, and in 70 to 110 degrees usually the reduction will occur and if at all it is not occurring we can go for the cautious technique that means we will uh, we will make the patient externally rotate or uh, abd abduct abduct, abduct also so uh, while doing this the uh, shoulder so there is traction external rotation adduction and your... rotation tear you can tear. remember that that is a usual method if there is no other person available also you can type traction if counter traction is not able to provide you can go ahead with the tear method also so you do the traction then you do the external, external rotation, rotation then you do the adduction and internal rotation. rotation sometimes it will work sometimes it will fail but if you have a very counter traction available then the chance of uh, successful rate is very high so uh, supposedly the you are not getting reduced mm. okay so what will you do next uh, we should uh, look for any as, uh, associated in, uh, no, you are unable to reduce mm. you are uh, attempted twice or thrice mm. the patient is coming out of uh, your procedural sedation mm. what will be the plan complete sedation and like the patient should go to the theater and yeah. you should get a proper uh, anesthesia and, and you should try under general, general anesthesia. anesthesia that is the other option mm -hmm. and you have to rule out that whether they have missed anything so okay. that will be the uh, important thing suppose uh, you have done the reduction then what all what are the next thing that will, you have done the reduction mm. uh, the shoulder should be immobilized sir mm. uh, in young patient at least two to five weeks shoulder should be immobilized uh, either with position a, uh, in an adducted and internal rotated position. Okay, so you have to give what? You have to give, uh, a, give a arm sling or a um, shoulder sling or shoulder immobilizer should be given, sir. In younger patient, they are uh, suggesting for uh, to two to five uh, weeks immobilization should be there. In adults, uh, at least two weeks because adults there is a risk of stiffening and all. So two weeks immobilization should be. There. So uh, for his, you are planning to discharge him. Uh. So what will be the discharge advice? Uh, before discharge, we should take a repeat X-ray mm -hmm. and uh, confirm that it is uh, in position. And make sure that he's conscious oriented everything. All your vitals are to be back to normal. Mm -hmm. You are given a procedure sedation. Document the post uh, uh, sedation vitals. Mm -hmm. Then get an X-ray. Then uh, drugs. Recurrence. Drugs. Drugs. Discharge. Discharge. Drugs. What all drugs you will give? Anti-inflammatory drugs should be mm. given, sir, and analgesics uh, should be given. Okay, and instructions, specific instructions? Uh, it, immobilization, uh, check for the uh, finger movement should be mm. done, sir. Uh, check for uh, the loss of sensation. So, there is the a high chance of recurrence. recurrence. That's the one thing. So, what, what instruction you will give to him? He should avoid which type of movements? Abduction, uh, next time. Uh, ex abduction, uh, hyper extension uh, activities everything need to be decreased so that instruction you need to give and you should ask him to review with an orthopedician later on and if an MRI is needed if there is any uh, rotator cuff, cuff injury yes. everything that need to be corrected and maybe you have to fix these things so he is having second time dislocation yes, so there is a high chance that he can have a third time dislocation also so all those things need to be done okay. anything else sir? see immediate post procedure sedation observation Till the patient is recovering, if you are to keep it, yeah. what monitor, who will be monitoring, what are the anticipated you know, side effects, for example, vomiting or mm -hmm. in the respiratory pressure, all these things should be kept in mind till the patient is recovered and should be reassessed and documented. And on disposition, suppose you want to send tail along with somebody who can take care of the patient and give clear instruction not to drive or write. Yes. 
or go near the kitchen or electrical appliances or water resources or these things you can mandatorily use. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, good. Good presentation. Bye.